When Mark first found out we were doing a C6 ZR1 video, he was worried. And then I told him we were doing two C6 videos this summer. He was furious. And then I got him in this cabin. He was a rate. He was so angry that this did not fulfill his Takumi Craftsman standards, he fled. In fact, he took all the camera gear with him and demanded that I film the entire interior B-roll of this car in a gas station parking lot. So I did. Now, very quickly, again, because we're doing another C6 video later this summer, I'm going to go over the cabin. It is a fixed roof coupe, which means you do not have the target top. It still has a hatch, which makes this one of the most usable, dedicated sports cars, and the cabin is large enough for big people. It focuses on primarily analog technology, though it does still have a heads-up display. The cabin itself is pretty good. It's aged well. I will say the material choice is well below what it should be for a car that cost over $100,000 in the late 2000s, but oh well, no one is buying a ZR1 for the interior space. So with that, let's head into the shop and put this thing on the lift. C6 ZR1. This is a car that is very serious, despite how you and I feel about Corvettes as a whole. When this thing came out in 2009, it was no joke. It did over 200 miles an hour and is one of the fastest cars around the ring and was a relative bargain for the performance you were getting in this vehicle. And it had exotic materials, everything you were expecting in a supercar. And that's what General Motors was trying to accomplish with this car. They broke every new ground they could possibly break with a car that largely was a carryover for multiple generations, right? Yeah, so the basic principle architecture of the C6 is a derivative of the C5 Corvette, which means a double wishbone front and rear car with aluminum subframes, and transverse leaf springs plus a transaxle. In fact, the cars share some of these same parts. For example, the shifter in the C5, C6, and C7 Corvettes are all interchangeable. Wow. So they took basically everything they could do in typical GM fashion. They took something and made it into a, what is, in all intents and purposes, a, a supercar, super right? Yeah. So how did they go about doing that? Let's talk about the body first. So the front end of this car is carbon fiber. This is, in fact, one of the first real carbon fiber cars they worked on. In fact, GM pioneered the technology to have exposed carbon fiber. They patented the clear coat for the roof of this car, which is carbon, where they could leave it unpainted and it would not degrade due to UV rays. So they came up with the chemical to coat it. And what else did they do here that was a first for GM, Jack? They also supercharged this engine, which is mind-blowing. And this is one of the first Corvettes with magnetic dampers as well. And carbon ceramics were a first for GM with this. So this was the turning point for the Corvette to turn it. it they kind of turned up the volume on this, <laughs> literally, figuratively, and it, it took the Z06, which was naturally aspirated of this era, and then how much horsepower did this make? So when this car was stock, and as you may be able to tell already, this car is far from stock, <laughs> it makes 638 horsepower at the crank, which was good for zero to 60 in like 3.4, 3.5 seconds according to General Motors, and a low 11 quarter mile time with a top speed, I think, of 202 miles. And they were trying to break the ring record with this as yes. well. Yes, and I think when it first came out, and there were a series of updates made to the C6 ZR1, including PTM, which is available in later cars, that is performance traction management. In 09, when this came out, I believe it did a 719 ring time. Unbelievable. Which is unbelievable. No, I mean, even to today's standards, I mean, it's an unbelievable what they were able to pull off, get out of this car. Uh, and it's kind of an underappreciated car, even though we're going to make a lot of jokes, as you're going to see right now from the covert <laughs> development from the GM heads that make this sound like, oh, they did it all behind closed doors. We couldn't talk about the car, obviously, because people in the hallway or other parts of GM would know we were referring to an unauthorized program, so we came up with a code name. As you can see, somebody was obsessed with their college mascot, like every senior executive these days, like the work, my old corporate job, every room and conference room and office had to be named after some high school uh, mascot or college mascot or whatever. So this got that Yes, treatment. this was called the Blue Devil. And so we're going to do a C6 Z06 video later this summer. So I'm going to gloss over a lot of the advancements made to the C6 over the C5. But the core thing is it does carry over the base architecture of the C6 Z06, which is a fixed roof aluminum body structure, body structure for the C6. So what else do we have here? What else has been changed? 
So you have, again, magnetic right dampers on the double wishbone suspension. You have a wider tracked front and rear for the ZR1, which is 285 fronts, 335 rears. You have a transaxle in this car, so your differential and your transmission are the back of this vehicle. Obviously, you have a limited slip differential, and just for the ZR1, they did a different sized half shaft for the left and the right to make sure it could handle the torque produced by this car, which it's an absolute monster in that regards. And it had a TR6060 with its own specific gear ratios just for the ZR1. No automatic option? No automatic for the ZR1. I don't know how anybody would buy this. <laughs> Speaking of which, how many did they actually manufacture? I believe according to the Corvette registry, they made about 4,400 of these and less than 3,000 of the C7 ZR1 that this replaced. Wow, so it is really low production. Yes. And what was the used market on this? So this car knew the base price, I believe was around $115,000 depending on options. The owner, before what's happening now with the used car prices, I believe paid in the low 60s. Wow. However, this car, as we're going to talk about when we get underneath the hood, has about $47,000 worth of modifications. Holy shit. Yep. All right, let's take a look at that, Jack. All right. Under the hood, Jack. I remember about 15 years ago, I got my Bradakovich exhaust on, and it was made in Slovenia, much like my ex-wife was. And she liked looking through this little window at me while I was polishing my power dome of my LS9 supercharger. But this does not look anything like the 2500 horsepower Corvette that I once had. And I don't know if you remember back in the 90s, but uh, street racing and school zones with this was a big deal for me. <laughs> I mean, I was huge on the internet. Oh, I'm sure you were, Mark. This car, however, only makes a measly 875 wheel horsepower. What a joke. I know, it was weak. This guy's those are rookie numbers. Guy's only rolling about three inches with those type <laughs> of numbers. So what do we got? What's the stock engine like? So this is an LS9. The stock motor made 638 horsepower. It had a dry sump oiling system, which was similar to the dry sump found on the LS7. So there's a misconception that a lot of people have is that the LS7, which was found in the Z06, which was naturally aspirated, made 505 horsepower and rev to 7,000 RPM, was a similar motor to this. This actually has more in common with the LS3, which is the base 6.2 liter V8 found in the C6 generation. However, in this car's case, the internals are basically largely forged, they're all strengthened, and it was hand-built in the Wixom Performance Build Center in Michigan, and then shipped to Bowling Green where these cars, the ZR1s, were built on the exact same line as the regular C6s. Obviously, once again, the, the body differences are pretty substantial. It is the wide body. It has the carbon fiber hood that you can see, the polycarbonate, basically, piece of glass that you could then see the LS9 blower with, carbon fiber front fenders, and a carbon fiber hood. It's a lot of work they did to this. Yes. And by necessity, you have all the cooling, you have the power that they had never made before. So it makes sense that they wanted to hand build this and they wanted to change it. It was the bottom end that was different on the LS9, correct? Or was it the head work? So the head work came from the LS3. The bottom okay. end, I believe, basically all of the basic internals on this were stronger than the regular okay. LS3. And they decided to do that because of the boost level of the supercharger applying mm. all that force. So this is a root style blower from Eden. It's the R2300 and it makes 10.5 pounds of boost factory. And obviously the whole cooling system is dramatically different than the regular C6. Obviously you have a different front end of this vehicle. They had to balance cooling for this car on the track as well as dealing with the airflow at GM claimed like a 205 or 202 mile an hour top speed. And that is a big engineering challenge. Remember, car, airplanes take off at like 180 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot to deal with. And of course, you have the dry sump oiling system. Yeah, my private jet takes off well below 180 <laughs> miles an hour. I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about that. I, I think really overall for the era that this was designed, it was absolutely groundbreaking. Yeah. I mean, just you, you may just see it as a regular Corvette, and it's easy to because it just looks like every everything. other Corvette. But this is a very special car, and I think it's been undervalued and underpriced on the used market too. These cars are probably going to appreciate, and rightfully so. They're amazing. Let's take this out on the track because when you're dealing with a, what is a thousand horsepower to the crank, uh, I'm a little bit scared of what this would do <laughs> on the street. What with, about all your street racing, Mark? Yeah, but I retired from oh, that okay, now and right. now I'm in the four cylinders. <laughs> all right, Mark. So we're here at Autobahn Country Club in this C6 ZR1, which as you and I both know, is about the farthest thing from possible stock. We've already messed up our first take. 
where I'm pretty sure I caused you to urinate. Oh my god, dude. I am I, I'm so terrified being in this thing. I'm not <laughs> even kidding you. Uh, let me give the viewers a quick breakdown of what this thing's like to drive first. If you've driven a C5 or a C7, the, the dynamics of the vehicle are very similar. The car... Uh, it communicates very, very well with you. But it lets you turn. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it lets you turn in under braking, uh, which is, <laughs> uh, you know, it does allow you to rotate the car under braking extraordinarily well. The steering is very communicative, but the rear end of this car, because of 875 horsepower and some very tortured Pilot Super Sports, it's like you're driving in a blizzard. God, dude, this thing is so fast. I, I, I think the part of the reason I'm so terrified of this is the ZR1 was kind of a sketchy car to begin with, and then you add all of this aftermarket shit to it, I just feel like I'm in a fucking tin can. <laughs> Yeah, but hey, as you were mentioning earlier, the ride quality and the fact that Corvettes have this great ability to be a dual purpose car, absolutely dominate a racetrack, be relatively cheap to run, and still a pretty good daily driver is admirable, to say the least. No, I, I do think the ride quality is way better than I expected, and I think when you're probably focused in on driving this and feeling all the connectedness that's actually here, um, which we're not getting on these tires and the overkill horsepower. This would be an amazing machine to pilot uh, for the price, of course. Yeah, for sixty to seventy thousand dollars. Not to mention the brakes being carbon ceramic or. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, competent. I'm going to say that they are. Despite being carbon ceramics, they're not an on and off switch. Okay. They do have a pretty good job in giving you the feel that you're kind of expecting in a car like this if that makes sense to you yeah I, I think this car would be much better suited with it's around here at least there's a huge wow factor to the you know we keep saying a thousand horsepower which that's crank there's a huge wow factor to how fast it is but it's not really manageable no it is zero percent manageable all right wheel is totally straight No, this thing is fucking, it's it's insanely fast in a straight line. Hey, you know what I will say though, Mark, despite us doing this now for probably six laps, the temps are all staying pretty, pretty reasonable, which is, you know, not what I was honestly expecting in a car like this. Admittedly, we're not going flat out, but I don't think really anyone is. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, <laughs> dude. Wow. So is this faster than the uh, 720S that you drove? It, it's it's scary. I, I would say that I can't tell the speed because I'm so scared <laughs> and I'm in the passenger seat. It feels it feels faster, absolutely faster. Uh, well, Mark, we're turning into the pits. Hopefully this hasn't taken too many years off your life. <laughs> Dude, I'm so fucking car sick right now. I think it's just the phobi phobia that's creeping in. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, man, good thing you're about to uh, uh, get back and to film some carts, right? Yeah, I can't wait to get back into my three-cylinder, dude. <laughs> Final thoughts on the C6 ZR1. As I mentioned at the beginning of this film, we will be doing a long technical retrospective on the C6 generation as a whole later this summer with a C6 Z06. But with that said, what about the ZR1? Well, if you are an American muscle car fanatic, you love loud V8s that produce too much horsepower, or you just want a really, really fast car, you will be blown away by the ZR1. Even 11 years later, this is still one of the best performance bargains currently on the market. It's unbelievably fast. It's mostly reliable, and the C6 platform, if respected, is a very capable performance car with relatively natural inputs. And its negatives are this. It's still a late 2000s GM product, so the interior is less than desirable. It is quite the handful if you don't know what you're doing, and it will bankrupt you at the pump. This car, at least the one we tested, got 8.6 miles to the gallon, which is <laughs> it's something else. So with that said, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you soon. Real cool. Buy a 800 horsepower Corvette, they said. It'll be fun, they said.
<laughs> no shit. It's pretty quick.